Lord, for your glory, we sing your praises, we magnify your holy name. All for your glory, Lord, we bring blessing, we seek to honor you all of our days. We lift our hands, we lift our praise to you, we worship all you are. That, are, that view it later in the week to be able to keep up with all of it, so it's not live right now, but it will, I'll put it, uh, for those that are home, I'll put this, this Bible study sh sometime this afternoon, I'll put it up uh, on the website or, and on the YouTube channel so, so folks can catch up to at least the Bible study side uh, of our study uh, this morning. Appreciate again uh, everyone being able to be with us this morning. I, I ended up here in, in verse 49-ish in Luke chapter 9 the other day. Uh, again, I told you Wednesday we're just we're just blazing a trail through Luke nine. But anyway, um, but I wanted to come back because I I needed to give you an opportunity. I, I kind of had to stop class. We had kids coming up. We were still talking Wednesday night, and we had kids already in the pews, and and we were trying to to finish up and 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 get through that. But I wanted to come back to this comment that is made when when John. So they just had that conversation uh, earlier, right? About about how uh, there were. Uh, that they needed to humble themselves like this little child, that, that we spoke Wednesday night about the humility that would be necessary as relates to those kinds of things. And, and we even looked at the other narratives that, that addressed uh, those same kinds of sentiment. And then Luke records for us that John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out demons in thy name, and we forbade him because he followeth not with us. But Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against you is for you, or he who is not against us is for us. And so I wanted to come back to that because I knew some of you had seen it in, in both versions, and that's it's interesting, right? You and us are somewhat different. They're similar, but they're somewhat different in terms of pronouns. Um, there's not really any Greek benefit that I could look at that would help me understand if there was anything there, and there's not really anything there, because if they're with Jesus, they're with Jesus, right? I mean, it, it's, it's not, uh, the point isn't necessarily to try to distinguish his disciples and their work from his work. Their work was his work, and his work was their work. They were, that are inter, intertwined uh, in that sense, but, but basically, he's trying to get them to realize that yes, there may be others involved in the cause and purposes that I have, and they may not be part of this 12 nucleus of individuals that I've chosen for a particular purpose. There are going to be others. In fact, fast forward, I mentioned this Wednesday, in the very next chapter, he's going to talk about what? There are 70 other people that he chooses to send out uh, to, to present his message and talk about the coming kingdom, and, and he even induces them with, with some power. Uh, when they, they leave that scene. So the apostles, though they have a very peculiar and specific role and purpose within the grand scheme of what God desires to, to accomplish through His Son, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that uh, they're going to be the only ones that He ever uses uh, in His cause. And so He tells John, don't, don't forbid them. If they're, they're with us, they're with us. And if you look at those other narratives and... and uh, um, trying to find my cheat sheet that I uh, noted a, a couple of things. But in Mark 9, chapter 30, uh, or verse 37, uh, he, he makes a further comment in that text that, that if they have the power to do miracles, they're not going to speak against me. <laughs> they're not going to resist who I am when I've given them the ability to perform these things. There's, there's going to be consistency in that relationship. So, so the basic point is be humble enough to recognize that there's more than just you all that are going to be serving me and honoring me and having works and purposes that I need to fulfill. But I told you Wednesday that those were my thoughts as it relates to it. I would give you a chance and come back if there were any further questions or comments you had about the, that part. I just wanted to be sure because I know I kind of cut class off quickly uh, Wednesday night. Okay, let's move on then. So after all that, it comes to pass... By the way, the subject matter is not really over. It's odd how he kind of gets away and then he comes back. But, but Luke says, It came to pass then when the time was come that he should be received up. 
he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. Now let's pause for a minute. Why, why would it be a big deal that, that he's dry, walking through Samaria and they knew he was heading towards Jerusalem and so they didn't want him there? Why? Why? Okay. So, so th there was not a lot of love lost between the Jews from down in Jerusalem and these folks that lived in the region of Samaria, there was not a lot of love between those entities. And when they determined or figured out that his, he, he's not coming here, he's going through here to get to Jerusalem, we don't want him here. Now, interestingly, what's James and John's reaction to that? Fire from down from heaven. All right. So, so James and John's reaction is, well, we'll just deal with these guys, right? They don't want us here? Well, we've got this power, and so we're just call fire down from heaven. And he says, "Do you?" they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? And it's, it's, it's interesting because the... What scene is he referring to when it comes to Elijah? Anybody remember that? Okay, there's that scene. But if you remember, he, he calls, he sends 50, and he goes up there, and, and they, they destroy those messengers, and he sends, and, that, and, and he calls fire down to, to deal uh, with that particular situation as it, as it refers to those things. I thought I had that text written down, and it's left my... my uh, my mind, but uh, maybe I didn't write it down. But uh, but anyway, you can you can. They made this connection that well, we we've got this power. Why don't we just do what Elijah did and call fire down? And we'll just deal with these folks. What's Jesus's response? But not, not just no, but what what does he say? Yeah, yeah. But he turned and rebukes them. Okay, he doesn't just say, "Nah, that's not a good idea. Maybe we shouldn't do." It. He rebukes them for even thinking it. He rebukes them and said, You know not what manner of spirit ye are of, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And so they did what? Let's go to another village, right? We don't need to destroy this one with fire because they didn't welcome us. We just need to move to another village. By the way, should they have kind of understood that principle? And why? Think about that. Okay, so as part of that limited commission, if you remember, he didn't say if you, if you go into a community and they don't receive you, call fire down from hell and heaven to destroy it. He said, if you go into a community and they don't receive you, shake the dust off your feet and go to the, the next one. So that basic principle should have already been understood. And so he looks at them and he says, you don't understand the spirit or nature of, of what we're doing here. I didn't come... To destroy people, I, I came to save them. And I can't save, ultimately, this village if we call fire down from heaven in order to destroy them. They'll never have an opportunity to come to know who I am and what I'm about if we call fire down. And so, so let's just move on. But it's, it's another aspect that Jesus' disciples... Now we've seen it twice, right? First was... Well, these guys over here are saying they're with you, but they don't walk with us. They don't, they don't travel with us. So we told them to stop it, and Jesus had to humble them. And then that, he brings the child in, and he shows them an illustration of how humility needs to take place and that they need to be converted just like that little child and behave in, in those more accepting ways. And now we've got another issue. So here was a group of guys that were with us, and they tried to forbid them now there's some folks that are against them, and they're now thinking, well, should we call fire down to destroy them? Jesus is challenged. And I'm not saying he's incapable of handling it. I'm just saying it's a challenge. Because his disciples, seemingly in the early stages here, are having difficulty understanding what their real role is. 
and, and why, why they've been chosen for particular purposes and how it is they should handle those responsibilities. Um, and they're not, they're not handling them very well at this point. And many of them, obviously James and John in particular here, are, are struggling with the humility necessary to fulfill the work that Jesus has uh, in store uh, for them. Thoughts or questions up to that point? Well, just by just thinking about some of the things that David even said in Psalms and with the, with the account in, the, in, in Kings, uh, in the past, they always looked upon God as you know, wrath to their enemies and things like that, and fire. It speaks of that very frequently. And now there, there's a transition happening. And so there were people war, basically. I mean, that's how they, they viewed it and you know, from their history. And I, and I think you're right. I think as they look back at their own history, that's how they saw things being resolved. When there was challenge or difficulty, you, you see God very directly handling uh, those kinds of moments. And they are in a transitional period where they're going to have to start thinking different uh, about how the kingdom of Jesus functions and works. Go ahead, Jim. What about men today who say, I've worked for Jesus, are they really? <laughs> and, and you talk about back to... Back to 49 and 50, those earlier texts. And, and I think Jesus illustrates, and again, we go to Mark 9, and we can, if you add that context, you see a bigger picture of what's happening there. Um, he, these were men that had already demonstrated the abilities and things. It, it, they were known, right? It, it, it wasn't, John didn't point to something they said or did that was contrary to Jesus. The only thing he pointed to was, they don't travel with us. And, and so Jesus says, if they're with us, they're with us. You know, they, if they're not saying things contrary to us, if they're not challenging the teachings that I'm offering, if they're aligning themselves with the principles and things that I'm doing, then they're with us. Um, the evidence was in the fruit of their work, not necessarily their words. And so it's, no, you're right, it's not just a matter of just saying, I'm with Jesus and therefore I am. But there was evidence that these men were with Jesus. The, the, the way they were conducting themselves, the, the only fault John could find with them was that they just didn't happen to travel with the twelve. Um, and, and so their, their fruit and their actions demonstrated that they were with Jesus. And I think the same could be said today. We, you don't, it's not just about what we say, but the fruits that we produce will be evidence as to whether or not Correct. we're following. Yeah, absolutely. Any other thoughts? So then he changes the subject again, sort of. But I think he's still talking the same line of thinking with his disciples. He's trying to re, re, you know, get their minds to think a little differently about the work and purposes that he has for them. And so now it comes to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Another also said, Lord, and we'll talk about all of it together in a minute, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at my home, at, at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. So Jesus talks about this idea of cost of discipleship here in the last verses of this text. Luke records it for us. And, and it's interesting because there are similar teachings in other, other narratives. Uh, for the next ten chapters in the book of Luke... Um, it is generally understood that Luke is dealing with like the last six to eight months of Jesus' life. And sometimes you'll have parallel teachings, but not necessarily parallel circumstances. And, and that makes sense, right? Because you, would, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be teaching different teachings to different audiences. The same messaging is going to be occurring. And so just, and my point is, just because you see similar language or teaching doesn't necessarily mean you're dealing with the exact same instance of when that particular teaching was offered. 
it's generally believed that these, la these next ten chapters of Luke, in fact, there are a handful of things that he's going to talk about and he he's going to record that none of the other writers even mention. Um, but it seems as though his focus becomes on these last weeks and months of the life of Jesus and the things that he encounters. And this teaching is, is taught in the other narratives, the other Gospels as well, but it's, it's a basic point. And that is, if you're going to follow me, what? Follow me. <laughs> and know what that means. If, if you're going to follow me, remember, foxes have a better home. Birds have a better At least they know where it is, right? At least the fox knows where his hole is. At least the bird knows where his nest is. The Son of Man doesn't have any... We've talked a lot in our class about how they struggled understanding the disconnect between their mindset of physical kingdoms and the spiritual nature of the kingdom of Jesus. Jesus is trying to get them to understand, listen, you, if you're following me, you're not following me because you're going to receive some great earthly kingdom. And you're going you're gonna to get in, sit, sit in palaces of gold and, and have all these, this great prestige in earthly terms come to you. I don't even have a place to lay my head. That's not the, what my king's about. So if you're going to follow me, know that right off the bat, Jesus said. If you're, if you're looking for something that is of earthly benefit, then you're looking in the wrong direction. That's, that's the phase one, if you will, of... <coughs> Let the dead bury the dead. It's just two different de deaths that we're talking about here. Obviously, the first one is his father is physically dead. The second one, is this like an indifference to God's word? When he says, let the dead bury the dead? And, I mean, if they're dead, they can't bury somebody, you know? I believe, Bob, it's a play on words. In other words, he's not, he's not literally saying, let the dead bury the dead. And I don't even necessarily mean, I don't necessarily think he's meaning it symbolically. In other words, I don't necessarily think he's saying, well, let, let those who don't want to follow me, let them take care of that, right? The, those that are dead to Christ, let them deal with that. I, I, maybe, but I've always viewed this much simpler. Just a play on words. If, if you're going to follow me, then commit to it. And the minute you start finding reasons why you can't, that list will continue. And that's what I've always seen in that. That, that it, whether it's, I've got to bury my father, or, or if it's, I need to go tell everybody goodbye, or if it's, right, you're going to find something else, some other reason. That's what I saw. I, again, I'm not, that's what I saw in those texts, so. And I, and I agree, I think he's, he's trying to establish what, what's the primary, where's your priority? And you can't let anything else interfere with it. That's my point, that, that little word, but. Yeah. And I agree with it. That's what I saw. And I, I mean, I'm not saying there couldn't there couldn't have been something meteor in a sense that that, uh, that that's there. Uh, I just saw it simpler uh, as it relates to that text. That just if you're going to start down this road of reasons why you can't follow me, then that that list isn't going to end. Um, is is what I saw uh, with Jesus's comments. Any other thoughts? So go ahead, Jim. I thought Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you're going to do it 100%. You're not going to let things in the world change your mind or move anything like that. And, and, and he uses an example at the end of that text in verse 66 of, of what that means, right? And a principle that they would understand. He said, a man puts his hand to the plow and looks back, what kind of line is he going to make? <laughs> right? Not, 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 a very, not a very good one. Um, and And... Uh, if you've ever if you ever had to line your own football field, you'd understand that principle. Because you get that you get that first corner off by a shade, <laughs> and now all of a sudden on one end your your field is twice as wide as it should be um, because your lines weren't you, you weren't paying attention, 
Or if you've ever tried to paint one, Zach back there laughing. He and I had spent some time doing that. It ain't easy to put your eyes focused straight ahead and stay focused and, and keep that line going, going straight. That's the point he's trying to make. You, if, if, you, if you're taking the very first step to follow Jesus and you're already trying to take that first step this, doing this, that isn't going to go so well. If you're already looking back, then you're going to struggle being a disciple of Jesus. You've got to step into this commitment, eyes focused ahead, um, no matter what might be behind you that you feel like you're leaving behind. And that's the commitment that it's going to take uh, from anyone who would be a follower of Jesus. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? All right, we made it. <laughs> that's exciting. Uh, let me take you real quick. I, I failed to do this um, when we finished chapter, uh, chapter 8. So let me go back, and if you have your question sheets, pull them out, and I'll, I'll actually go back and we'll do a refresher real quick from chapter 8 and chapter 9 since I, I, did not, I failed to look at chapter 8's questions uh, when, uh, when we finished chapter 8. So, so now really, you know, this was two months ago when we studied that, so, so good luck um, if you didn't write the answers down. But, uh, but who traveled with Jesus as he went through the cities and villages there at the beginning of chapter 8? Okay, well, but who, who were they specifically? Yeah, the, the women. I think that's, that's what he was trying to drive at. That's when that, that scene where we're told about those ladies that were helping and aiding them in that travel uh, uh, as it relates. Uh, what can we learn from the parable of the sower? Well, <laughs> we got 20 minutes. Go ahead, right? <laughs> what do we basically learn? That the, the seed falls where? Yeah, it fa- falls, it falls on all kinds of ground, and, and some will receive it. And then it quickly dies, some will have it choked out, and ultimately, hopefully, some of that's going to fall on good and honest hearts, um, and they'll be responsive uh, to that. Who did Jesus say were his mother and brothers? Well, yeah, those folks that were right in front of him, uh, those folks that, uh, that, that were standing in front of him. If you remember, that, that was when they, they came and they said, hey, your, your, your mom and your brothers are out here wanting to talk to you. And that's when he turned and looked at the people already standing in front of him and said, there, here's my mother, here are my, uh, my brothers. What happened on the way to the country uh, of the Gadarenes? Right, so that was that scene where the, the man who had, had legion and, and he comes out of the tombs and he, and he has that encounter and there's, uh, legion ends up... Uh, uh, well, that's the next question. What happened while Jesus was in the country of the Gadarenes and, and he sends that uh, legion... Uh, into those swine, and you see them uh, go off that hillside. Uh, they ask him to leave. Yeah, and ultimately they ask him to leave, right? Because they don't want any more of their herds or livestock uh, injured. What did Jairus request of Jesus there at the end of chapter eight? Yeah, right. And and, and that that scene where we're trying to uh, to find find healing there. Then the beginning of chapter nine. What did Jesus give to his twelve disciples? Yeah, so, so if you go back at the very beginning of chapter 9, uh, you'll see uh, that he calls them, and that's when he gives them the power and authority over all the devils uh, to cure diseases um, and, and the various things. So when they went out to preach the kingdom, uh, there would be evidence that they were legitimate uh, in relationship uh, to that responsibility. Why did Herod the Tetrarch seek to see Jesus? Okay, so, so he'd, he'd been hearing about the things that Jesus was doing, and, and basically he's like, i got to see this for myself, because people were saying this could be John the Baptist, and I know I put him to death, and, and, and maybe it's, it's, it's one of these other prophets, and so he wanted to see uh, for himself uh, as it relates to those things. Why was, the pub, why was public opinion divided about who Jesus was? Right, whom do some, whom do they say that I am? Right, that conversation. Why and why was there? Why do you think there was division? I don't know that we ever really discussed that a lot. 
Okay, so, so the challenge was either this is the... They understand there's something peculiar about him, right? They know he's different. There, there's something very, very different and powerful and authoritative about him. So once we commit to that, now we've got to decide who he is. And if we admit he's the Messiah, we admit he's Jesus the Christ, the only begotten of the Father, then what do I need to do in relationship to that? Yeah, I've got to start following and listening to him. But if I can diminish that and say, well, maybe he's, he's, he's got all the... But maybe it's Elijah, or maybe it's one of the other prophets. Then, then it diminishes my in my mind, maybe, the responsibility I have uh, as it relates to him. So there was lots of public opinion about who he was, and their lack of willingness to kind of commit to, to who he really was is why you conjure up other explanations that people uh, might, uh, might think. It, it's interesting because, it just in an odd way, you often wonder a little bit about, well, had they ever experienced that before? I mean, they're starting to see Jesus raise people from the dead, but uh, had they ever witnessed a reincarnation? You know, why your mind goes to reincarnation of... Anyway, it's fascinating, right? But if you don't want to believe He's Jesus, but you can't deny His power, you got to come up with something, right? you gotta, you got to come up with some explanation. And so, so they, they started creating them. So what happens then there at the Mount of Transfiguration? In simplicity. Okay, so we see Moses and Elijah and Jesus present there. Uh, he takes three of his disciples are present as well. Uh, this this magnificent scene unfolds. There's a conversation about Jesus' impending uh, crucifix, crucifixion that is coming. Um, Peter wanted to do what? Yeah, he wanted to build three three reminders, three monuments, if you will, to to the to the grand moment that they where they witnessed uh, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah together. But God intervenes and says, yeah, "This this is my son. This is the one that we need uh, to be paying attention to." What teaching of Jesus did the disciples not understand in Luke nine forty four through forty five? Yeah, that conversation about his death. He's they're still struggling with that. Um, and, and he didn't spend a lot of time on it, he, at least in Luke's record, and, but they're, they're struggling uh, with that concept. Brian, uh, they were looking for a perfect king. Yeah, yeah I, think I think you're right, you're right Gary. The, the fact of what they were looking for wasn't necessarily matching who Jesus was caused them to struggle uh, as to what they would do. And then ultimately... <coughs> Excuse me. Why did the Samaritans reject Jesus? Yeah, hey, traveling through, and there was no love lost between the Samaritans and and the Jews from down in Judea. And, and we didn't take time today, but you can go back and look at all the back history on that, and and begin to understand why there's animosity uh, between those entities. And, and then we discussed at the end of our class today, why, what did Jesus mean by saying, let the dead bury their own dead? And we had that conversation just this morning uh, of the various thoughts as it relates uh, to that. So that is the quick summary of chapters 8 and, uh, eight and 9. Any last comments about any of those verses or text? Yeah, I'm listening. Go ahead. Back to just real quickly to the transfiguration scene. And I don't remember if we talked about it then, but the fact that it was Moses and Elijah, it was the law and the prophets, and then Jesus and God says, The law and the prophets are over. Yeah. My son is here now. Like he grew one of them. Yeah. It's a, it's a very visual and, and, and purposeful re representation of the change. The law and the prophets got us to Jesus. But it's time to listen to him, to him now, and the importance of that. So, verse one then of chapter ten, he says, "After these things, the Lord appointed over other seventy also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place, whether whether he himself would come." 
And therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he should send forth laborers into his harvest. It's interesting, right? We, we hear that phrase sometimes, and sometimes we forget from where it came. And it, it comes from this moment where, where if we're accurate in describing these next ten chapters or so of Luke as being kind of these last few months and weeks leading up to the crucifixion, then you can kind of see the urgency, right? There's lots of things that have to happen before that moment can happen, and there are not a lot of laborers ready to handle those responsibilities, Jesus says. And so, so he can no longer just use the, the 12 apostles. He chooses 70, sends them out two by two like he did earlier with the, with the apostles themselves. And, and it's kind of interesting, you almost want to call that the limited, limited commission and then now you've got the limited commission and then you'll have the great commission to come but but these men are going to serve the same kinds of purposes uh, that Jesus originally did. Uh, and it, or they it, it appears after. It seems to in his language because if you notice, even in 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 chapter nine, Luke will record it. He'll say, "And after these things, and after these things, and then after these things, and now he says in verse one of chapter ten, and after these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also." Now. It, so it appears chronological in his description. Um, again, I'd have to go back and, and examine uh, some of the other parallels, but, but uh, uh, it, though Luke, in fairness, we need to remember, Luke doesn't necessarily always give himself over to chronology, though. In other words, he's, he's not as focused on giving us a timeline approach. He gives much more of a here's the things that happened uh, approach at times. Right. And so, so, so he, you know, the, these things, but I, I do think these things seem to definitely happen after Jesus had to humble his disciples as it relates to we saw others and they were worked. So it is, I don't know whether that's where you're heading, but, but is, that, is that the others? Are these 70 the, the others that he said, that John said, we forbid them, and Jesus said, don't forbid them, they're with us. Are these those guys? Maybe. <laughs> it could be, but we, I don't know that it tells us specifically. At first, there were only the 12. Yeah. So it had to occur some point after that. And, and it seems like that Jesus is trying to help the, his apostles appreciate that, again, that there are going to be more men involved uh, in this. So, John, be careful who you're forbidding because they may actually be with us. And it wouldn't be shocking if some of those that Jesus referred to there and that John was referring to are part of this group of people as well. wouldn't shock me. I don't know that I could prove it, but it wouldn't shock me. You understand what I mean? perform miracles because in chapter 9 they could cast out demons and then you get chapter 10 um, and verse 19 said they could tread on serpents and scorpions and had other powers so they were chosen great time, yeah. so, so they, 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 they they were chosen for this purpose um, most likely prior to this and endued with the power and especially if you add Mark 9's record because it, especially if you're trying to think about it in a timeline, because I think Mark's record actually records that Jesus said, if they're performing miracles in my name, how can they be against me? In other words, they were already doing it um, and, and in, leg in legitimate ways. Um, so they would have had to have received uh, that ability uh, from some sort. So, so it may very well be that these 70 are, are a group 
that have already been serving in, in capacities in, in relationship to the work of Jesus that are now being singled out for a very specific commission uh, that Jesus establishes. It's hard. Timeline's hard um, because you know, the various gospel records will sometimes interchange them and put one before the other in terms of how it's written. And that's why I say I don't know that Luke is always as interested in getting it on a timeline as much as he is just telling us the events and circumstances that happened. Pointed out of that group of disciples, which obviously included the seven of them, was much older than the apostles was. But I'm wondering at that time that they were all given the powers that was, was used in uh, what is it, verse 49 or 99? I, I don't know. That's yeah. what I was. No, that's I what I was. My mind was being. It, 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 and I don't know that we've got much. I'll go back and look and, and see if there's something I'm missing in, in the other gospel accounts that maybe would help give me some clarity on that. But but I don't know that we have clarity as to the as to a timeline as to exactly when did each of these entities receive these various things. We know they have them at various times, but but when um, I'd have to go back and look. Get any clear. Go ahead, Jim. Are we saying that uh, these 70 have the same power as the 12 had? Well, same as a relative turn. If you mean identical, I don't know. But they have power. Uh, they're going to demonstrate it here before the chapter's over. He's going to talk about the things that they're going to be able to do. Um, and so they, he gives them um, he gives them the abilities, certain abilities. Now, whether they're identical to everything the apostles had or not... I, Right, but they definitely have something beyond what's ordinary, um, and we'll see that before we're done with the text. This is Jesus got a lot of Recover. This gets, like you say, getting to Yeah, he's running out of time. Right, and so therefore, this need to have more laborers out there involved uh, in this purpose. <laughs> Uh, about about the yeah, about this number, I believe he's the only one that makes this kind of specific reference. Um, there are hints in other texts uh, when it comes to to Jesus saying because he because Jesus talks about this situation where John wanted to forbid these guys over here, and Jesus says, "Don't forbid them; they're they're doing my work." Um, so there's hints that there's other people involved. I believe you're right though that Luke is the only one that kind of gets this specific about about that. But I, again, I, I, that's just what I'm recalling in, in my own study. So he says, Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. And in the next breath he says, Don't take anything with you. <laughs> Go as lambs among wolves. Uh, that doesn't sound like a fair fight, by the way, does it? Right? You know, that doesn't sound like I'm going <laughs> to... This doesn't sound good. I'm, I'm the lamb and they're the wolf. And then you're telling me, don't take purse, don't take a script, don't take shoes, and salute no man by the way. And into whatsoever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if the son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give. For the labor is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to to house. Now let's stop and at least talk about this section first. So, it, similar but somewhat different than what he had originally commissioned his, his apostles to go out uh, and do. Why, why do you think he would tell them that, that uh, in the last part of verse 4, to don't, don't salute anybody along the way? And I think you're right, Bob. I think what he's trying to say, he's not saying be impolite. What he's saying is their, their extensive cultural greetings, there wasn't time for that. You, you, don't, you don't have time um, to, to stand 
and, 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 and have an extended period of greeting and, and exchange with, with folks as you're traveling from one community to the next. You need to get to the next one and get, get busy in the work, again, because there's, the laborers are few, time is short, and there's a lot to get done. And so, so he's basically giving them encouragement here uh, to realize that. And I suppose all of us have been there, right? You know, uh, I, when, when I want to go into Walmart fast, I wear a ball hat and glasses, if I can think of it. <laughs> because I'm just trying to get in there and get, get what I need and get out of there, right? And, and, and so, 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 and it works, by the way. I've even had guys that know me all my life, and I'll go in there in a ball hat, and they're like, I ain't even recognizing them. I'm like, that's the point. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, it, you know, right? You're busy. You got to get something done. And the last thing you can do, and 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 trust me, you've done it. Don't don't tell me you haven't. You have ducked down a different aisle, because you knew it wasn't being impolite. You just knew that if you bumped into them, I'm in for a 45 minute conversation. It's right. Yeah, it's exactly right, Jim. He's saying don't don't lose focus. Don't get distracted on the road by a, a group of individuals that, that want to take your time away. There's too many important things we got to get done. And so he's not telling them to be rude. He's just telling them, listen, you don't have time for all the customary... Uh, I'm kind of greedy. Go ahead, Tom. <laughs> Sage advice. So whatsoever, he says, then you go in, offer peace to that house, if it doesn't receive it, then what? Yeah, the peace will come back to you. Go to the next place. Go to the next house. Now, it's interesting, though, if you find a place that's willing to what? Yeah, willing, willing to keep you, then you don't, need to, you don't need to go from house to house to house to house to house. If I recall, that's slightly different than what he told his apostles when he sent them out on their commission. I'd have to go back and double check my, my, my thinking here, but I think he kind of gave them the impression to just keep you know, relocating, relocating, relocating. Uh, but if they can spend an extended period of time and get the work done, then you, and there's that, the peace came to that, then you're, you're, the work you're doing is worthy of its hire. And if they're caring for your needs and taking care of your sustenance while you're there then so be it, because your work and purpose uh, in the kingdom is important. Um, and, and, and to be sustained for doing that work uh, is, is an appropriate thing. And I think that's a great principle, by the way, that we continue to think about, um, that for those who work in the kingdom and, and the purposes of the gospel, um, have, have the right, if you will, to be sustained um, while they're doing uh, that work. Not to be aggressive in your approach to speak in line of the region. So there, there are a lot of things that they need to consider as it relates uh, to this. Appreciate the thoughts and comments. We'll jump back into this Wednesday night um, and get back into Luke chapter 10. But as we dismiss this morning, if you would, let's have a word of prayer together. Our Father in heaven, thank you again for the day you've blessed us with, the opportunity to worship you and to study from your word. Uh, we're just so thankful that you've given us your wisdom and it guides us and leads us uh, every day. Strengthen us to appreciate you more and more. Help us to know that you're ever-present, uh, that we can seek you and, and find refuge in you. Uh, give us a heart that wants to do that and to encourage as many as others as we can uh, to seek you as well. And be with us and bring us back tonight as we continue to honor you this day. And we pray this through Christ's name. Amen.